social distancing at the Chamber Flying Solo tonight. My name is Garrick Taylor. We're joined tonight by a special guest, economist Jim Rounds. Jim's second appearance on the show. Uh, Jim, the way that uh, the days all blend one into another, you might as well have been on three years ago, not three weeks ago. Yeah, it feels like it. All right, let's talk about some good news that Arizona has on the economic front. Last week, two big announcements. Zoom announces it's going to be bringing hundreds of jobs to the Valley. And then, as if that wasn't big enough, big time uh, Asian chip maker, specifically out of Taiwan, TSMC, announces a multi-billion dollar investment in the Valley. Big picture, what does it mean for Arizona? Yeah, it's an incredible number, but if you've been working on how the economy's been uh, transforming in Arizona over the last decade, it really isn't a surprise. We really set up a great foundation. We worked on regulations, we worked on competitive tax policy, the right economic development tools, and now we're working on uh, workforce. Um, that's why I was a big supporter of the new economy initiative by the universities. These types of things bring in these businesses. And so while the number is staggering, 12 billion, uh, the, the fact that it's coming here doesn't surprise me a bit. Even though this is a tough downturn for us, it's tough everywhere, but I still feel like we're the state to beat when it comes to the economy going forward. Um, this is another lesson that you work with economic developers at a state and local level in, in your job you know, on a consulting basis. We are in a major economic downturn. We're living through a pandemic. The work of economic development doesn't stop, does it? No, the, the work is never done. Even in good times, you have to keep working because your competition is working. So you always have to keep bettering yourself. You have to have leaders that are true leaders, not just you know by the generic definition, but actually want to try to make a difference and improve us day to day. And that seems to be what we have in the executive branch and also with the legislature right now. So I'm hoping we could keep advancing, but it's going to be difficult to lure some businesses here that um, maybe we're on the fringe of wanting to relocate, but most people know that this is a temporary you know, condition that we're going through. Yeah, it still could last a few more months, it could last another year, but it's gonna be transitory. And I think the big, the big businesses that would bring in a lot of high wage jobs are probably still looking. And I'm talking to some site selector buddies, they're indicating they still have a pipeline, it's a little weaker, but there's still a pipeline. Um. Jerome Powell was on 60 Minutes last night. He was asked if we're in the next Great Depression. And he said, no, and sounds a little bit like you in the sense that everybody knows the reason for this. This is not a fundamental breakdown of the, of the economy writ large. It's a specific issue that everyone is dealing with right now. Yeah, and because we were in a position of strength before this, and it is an unusual event, um, we're creating some pent up demand for production and consumption. Uh, not everything because everybody's been on kind of hold for a little while, but over the longer term, we're gonna be able to recoup some of the lost economic activity. We're still gonna see additional investment. The stock market still might be a little bit overvalued compared to the economic numbers, which are gonna turn a little bit south uh, over the next couple of months. But again, it, it, if you're expecting things to happen, uh, whether it's getting weaker in terms of the numbers, but then also following up with stronger numbers, you feel like there's a story out there. And I look at a lot of economic numbers and some, some tell you, you know, things are going up, some tell you things are going down. There seems to be a consistent story that this will be temporary. And I don't think, it, I think it was uh, uh, the Fed talking about the uh, downturn continuing through 2021. Uh, I, I don't see how that could happen. They, they use the word economic recovery. That means that we're growing. Now, whether we return to previous highs in terms of overall GDP production, that's different. But I, I guess I'm an optimist. I, I'm an optimist about this recession, but I'm, a, I'm very bullish on Arizona. Well, uh, that is good to hear because it's hard to be an optimist right now, Jim. Uh, the unemployment claims, you've seen the numbers. Um, there are some uh, feeling among economists the crowd that you run with, that perhaps that we've bottomed out on these new jobless claims. I'll let you speak to that, but let's delve into the crystal ball. Let's talk jobless claims and what's ahead in heck, the next several weeks, much less the next several months. I, I still think we have jobs to lose. 
um, income hasn't dropped as much as the employment. So we're primarily losing a lot of the lower wage jobs, which makes sense because we're talking about uh, tourism oriented jobs, restaurant and bars, those, you know, the, the lower rungs of the career ladder for a lot of individuals. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to be hard to know what to do with these businesses because while I appreciate um, PPP, uh, that really helps a business over maybe a couple of months. If this is something where it extends about six months, and I've done some pro forma on restaurants before, and I even talked today to a, a, a friend that had two restaurants and lost them both, mm -hmm. um, labor is about a third of the total cost. So there's a lot of other stuff that these businesses have to cover. So some some support for payroll is okay, but commodity prices are up. The you know, the, the supply chain for a lot of the different things has been disrupted. So very minor changes in prices really disrupt this low margin industry. So I think we're going to still lose more. But the good thing is when the economy is strong, we have a lot of entrepreneurs in these same areas and we're going to see them starting new businesses. So if we can save the ones that are a little bit stronger to help get through this, that's great. But some, some are going to go under and people are going to be unemployed. But I have full faith that we're going to come up with clever ways of creating additional economic opportunity just because that's really our focus here. Um, consumer confidence, it can be a tricky thing to uh, measure. Uh, Jim, if you went out to the street corner with a sandwich board and yelled, the economy's open, it doesn't really matter if no one wants to go out. So is that something that's just simply going to take time? Will it take a therapeutic or a vaccine? What does it take to get patrons back out spending money? Yeah, I think consumer confidence is, I, I, when I've given speeches in the past, I haven't included that one as much because it's kind of a feel-good measure. I like to look at the hard numbers, but this really is a consumer confidence-related downturn. Um, some of it's going to have to do with whether or not they feel safe just wearing masks. I mean, we, we go out and about, not to, to restaurants, but you got to go to the grocery store and you got to take care of other things, but right. use hand sanitizer and a mask and you're, you're, you're fairly safe. Uh, there's a number of people that I guess are protesting that a little bit, you know, fighting back because, you know, they, they don't want the government to be too oppressive. But uh, I hope that we don't have another spike um, if we open up the economy and we don't have people, you know, continuing to be safe because we can have an open economy and we can still be safe at the same time. So it's kind of like opening the economy, but in a smart way. Right. And it, some of it has to do with education on the business side and some of it has to do with education with individuals. So. I was tweeting over the last week that I really feel like we need to spend a little bit of money on some campaigns to say the government says you're open, but please continue to be safe, not only for yourself, but for others. Jim, this might be one of those issues where a little bit of peer pressure and a little education could go a long way. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right. You, we've talked about where we sit now. What are some risks? How could we make this worse? What could we really screw up and what keeps you up at night? I, I guess one of, the, uh, one of the uncertain points is uh, some of the initiatives that are out there. Um, I'm a little bit concerned with Invest in Ed. I get why people are frustrated. I really do have talked to the advocates and I, I, don't, I, I, I feel like I disagree with their argument, but I believe that they believe in their argument. Mm -hmm. um, if we have that impact on small businesses like we calculated in the past from that initiative, it's going to be very bad timing uh, coming out of this downturn. So the timing isn't ideal. Um, I'm a little concerned, a little bit more concerned about the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. We just wrapped up a study for uh, the uh, Office of Tourism and we're looking at a pretty significant decline. I think this last month there was about an 80% decline in activity. Uh, we're currently tracking in uh, May, um, like a 70% decline. We might finish the year 65 or 70% below uh, where we would have had as a baseline. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of tax collections. And so what we have to do in this case, and I'm all for a conservative government. I've looked at the tourism budget many times over. I never was a believer in a 20 to 1 return on investment or things like that. But I was a believer in a 1 to 1 return meaning that if we spend money on tourism, we are going to get it back. Right. But in this case, we need to figure out how to capture billions of dollars of lost activity where activity falls below this baseline trend that we had. 
And I'm kind of hoping that some of the numbers that we provided in this report are going to convince some lawmakers that maybe we need to double or triple the tourism budget because I'm afraid that some other states are going to do this and they're going to take our pent up demand for tourism. And no matter how we do the math in this case, because we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars to the state uh, in, in terms of potential gain in activity for every 10% that we recapture from these losses, um, doubling the budget, that, that's going to have an, a massive return on investment. The, the crazy numbers like I used to dismiss. So I'd encourage, I'd encourage lawmakers to at least think about an expanded budget for maybe two or three years until we get back to normal. The, uh, the chamber talking point on the tourism industry has been, it's an export industry, or it's import in the sense that it imports dollars from outside the state. These are valuable dollars um, that other states are clamoring for. And we are very fortunate to have what we have in Arizona and have some world-class offerings for tourists from all around the world. But Jim, I'll tell you, I am concerned about some of these issues you just talked about, but there's some real cross currents with uh, consumer confidence that you touched on. If people don't want to get on an airplane, there's a problem. If we're in hot weather months when occupancy levels are down anyway, that's another challenge that in any other normal cycle we're able to weather, uh, this is, it's more complicated this time. Yeah, and, and one of the interesting findings is that when, when we look at, at dozens and dozens of different reports and articles uh, you know, to prepare this analysis for uh, AOT, um, it looks like international travel is going to take a little bit longer to come back, mm. at least based on you know, a lot of expert opinion, and it makes sense. Mm. But we might have an opportunity to expand domestic travel. So if we can attract people from within the U.S. to come mm. here, I, I think that we could recapture some of this lost money. And you know, a $25 billion industry, and I think it produces around, you know, with the multiplier effect, about 10% of the general fund revenues. Yeah. It's something we have to be very careful with. So the math speaks for itself, but it's also common sense. So I think in this case, we might have to have some of the more conservative lawmakers maybe say, let's indeed act like a business, let's operate like a business and invest in order to make more. Uh, just to double back over something you mentioned about the ballot initiatives, we don't know whether some of these uh, particularly problematic ones are going to make the ballot. We have time to discuss that. But it would seem to me that a ballot initiative that is targeting small businesses for a surtax, an income tax surcharge, um, look, I might disagree with it at any time, but this seems to me like the worst possible time to slap on a surtax on small businesses. But uh, like you, I'm not doubting the sincerity of the proponents. It just seems like a bad idea. Yeah, and, and even, even if the economy wasn't down, we were pretty critical of the initiative two years ago. And the economic calculations that we had were just terrible. Um, I'm assuming that if we had to put together something similar this time around, given the state of the economy, it'd be even worse. Um, what, what, what I'm hoping is that uh, while, while I appreciate the enthusiasm of the other side, I'm hoping that this doesn't pass, but there's a renewed interest in cooperating and trying to figure out a solution where we could be efficient. You know, I, 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 was a, I wasn't a believer in uh, significant increases in university funding until I had to go through and do a business analysis mm. of what kind of return you're going to get on certain investments. And we were able to show pretty positive return on the new economy stuff. I have no doubt that there's ways we can improve K-12 and it may cost us a little bit of money, but if our economy is booming, if we set up this foundation and invest in the right areas, we're gonna have more than enough money. And in the end, uh, I still feel like uh, this is gonna be a great decade for us after we come out of this. And we will have enough money to take care of all these investment issues and maybe even have a little bit of tax reform, which in the back of my mind is something I've always been hoping for. Right. Well, as always, Jim Rounds, we appreciate the insight. You're willing to join with us and look into the economic crystal ball. Let's catch up in a few weeks. Sounds great. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, Jim.